Welcome to the Colby Cast. Thank you for joining us. Today, Bonnie and I are joined by Colby teachers, Sarah Lee and Kristen Crook, to discuss teaching children to read. The responsibility of teaching our children to read can feel overwhelming at times, but our guests today provide words of encouragement along with wonderful advice to help us on our way. We hope that you'll enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Bonnie, liturgical musician, popcorn and podcast fanatic, and Colby homeschooling mom to four lads and lasses of middle and high school age. And this is Stephen, homeschooling father of five and director of development for Colby Academy. Afternoon, Stephen. How's your week going? My week is going well. It's a, another great week of homeschooling. Oh, good, good. How about yours? Well, we're going through a bit of a re-entry here of sorts after a few weeks of a varied schedule for a play that three of my kids were in. That was uh, quite the quite the undertaking. It was a great experience, but it it meant some uh, reordering of the of the time each day. So we're playing a little bit of catch up now. So yeah, flexible. Colby is flexible. Right? Yes, <laughs> yes. And our online teachers, their online teachers, have been great about working with us for the the impact that the play had to their attendance in class and so forth. So we're grateful for that and working on getting stuff caught up and moving forward and figuring out where we are now. Anyway, we'll get there. It'll be all right. It was a good experience. Good time. Well, our topic today is another listener suggestion, this time about helping young students begin to read, an essential and hugely individual part of each person's education. We have two of our online instructors here with us for this conversation. Mrs. Sarah Lee and Mrs. Kristen Crook. Hello to you both. Hello. Hello. Thank you guys for joining us. It's great to see you again, Sarah, and meet you, Kristen. Listeners may remember Sarah from episode 82, Move and Groove, which focused on the lower elementary school years. We'll have a link for that episode in our show notes. Well, since that episode dropped, Sarah and her husband have welcomed a wee lad to the family, and Sarah (laughs) has taken on some new responsibilities at Colby. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you catch us up a bit? So little Noah was born over the summer. Mm -hmm. And so I've been able to shift into a different position at Colby this year. Last the past two years, I taught um, the kindergarten classes. Um, And this year I'm functioning more as a reading specialist. Um, And I work with, I do like an intervention learning lab. And then I've done a number of assessments for students. So when teachers would like a little more information on how the student is learning reading and just kind of what skill sets they have and what strengths and areas for growth they have. Um, I'll do a little assessment with some of the students. And then the learning lab that I do is with some kindergartners. Um, Since in the online setting, there's there's so many things we teachers would love to do (laughs) and so little time. It's nice to be able to have that learning lab setting where you can focus in on some of the skills that a few students might need a little more assistance with in the typical classroom setting, kind of like you would at a brick and mortar school, have some students, you know, work with an extra teacher for a little extra focus on certain areas. Okay. I was going to ask you what all that entailed. Great to hear that that those services are available to our Colby families. Yeah, we've just started them this year. So it's been a good, um, definitely a great addition to the elementary elementary program. Oh yeah. And Kristen, I hear you and Sarah are former schoolmates. Very true. Uh, What's the story there and what else would you like to tell us about yourself? Well, yes, I uh, graduated from Mount St. Mary's University um, a long, 11 years ago. Yep. And um, worked in another online learning environment and uh, landed at Colby this past October. I'm so blessed um, both for school for our own children and for my work as well. I've been helping out in grade reports with the advisors and do a little bit of grading for high school. And I was just blessed to collaborate on the phonics book that they're working on. It came in a beautiful time as I was starting to teach our own five-year-old how to read. So it was great. She's one of four. So it's been a new um, juggling adventure, Hmm. Um, but it, it's just been great so good deal well so from the get-go I have read aloud to my kids as something for us to do together especially when they were all little and we also listened to a lot of audiobooks but we didn't start homeschooling until my youngest had learned to read so I didn't embark upon any formal reading instruction per se 
Uh, that prospect is pretty daunting to me, quite honestly. In fact, one that stuck out to me as a hindrance in considering homeschooling back in the day, I was really like, mm, I can't do that. Uh, what would you say to folks like Bonnie in her younger years or to parents who have children on the cusp of reading? So I'll go ahead. I would say, yes, it can be. It definitely is, you know, intimidating, especially, I mean, if we think about it, like, I don't know, for example, something that I'm not, you know, used to teaching, like say basketball or something like that, that would be super daunting and intimidating, right. but there are lots of like small steps and little, little things that you can incorporate into learning and just kind of the environment at home that help to foster reading. Um, and it's small skills that build together, like building blocks to like get your child to learn to read. I think a lot of the, at least from my perspective, the intimidation could come with the fact of, oh my goodness, we have to get to reading. Like, here's the end goal. Ah, it's really big. How do we get there? But really like there's those little like building blocks that help along the way as children learn all the skills that they need to be able to read. Okay. So I think a big thing, something that I focus on in kindergarten, of course, but just in general for any family learning to read, a really big focus at the beginning is just really establishing um, letters and sounds because those are the literal building blocks of reading. Like a child, once they know the letters and sounds, they can start blending, they can start sounding words out, they can build sentences, but until they have those letters and sounds pretty solidly down, there's not much in terms of reading you can do. I mean, you can still build like the, you know, book functionality and left to right directionality and associating like the title page and the cover and how to read a book, but the actual pieces of reading really need those letters and sounds to be solid. I think one couple of things to add. Um, it's good to make the decision that this is just another thing, right? So they've already learned so many things at that age, right? They've learned, you've learned, you taught them to walk, you taught them probably to ride a bike, right? Just decide this is going to be a hard thing. We can do hard things, but we're just going to do it with joy. And so one thing that I found helpful, and this might sound funny, teach you to read first, <laughs> teach bomb to read first, because we've all learned in different ways. Um, like even little things I realized, like saying, the D sound as D, not D, right? Adding the uh. Um, if I hadn't, you know, realized that, you know, I realized like that's what was difficult for my fourth grader now, and we fixed it with the fifth, you know, the five year old. So just learning for yourself, when you do that, you realize all the little things that might be hard. And so you see them coming down the road as opposed to like, let's open this book and start reading it. It'll be overwhelming for you and for the kiddo. So you learn kind of the different ways to break it down. Like Sarah was saying, letters and sounds is primary directionality, but also being able to connect their interests into it. So observing them for a period of time, just saying, what are they into right now? I mean, we should always be doing that, but sometimes just even intentionally observing them just for 10 minutes and marveling it. You know, what are, how are they learning? Do they like to, you know, hear or sing or make, you know, all these little things will help later in doing the hard thing in the way that you're going to do it. So that's when I teach my students, you know, if it's something, you know, content wise or a skill that's hard, we, we do it with um, something funny or just a fun way to do it so that it's not this um, overwhelming experience. It, it's, there's like a vehicle of joy with it. If you make that commitment and just even ask the Lord to just pour joy into it, it's going to be joyful, really. What about some developmental considerations to keep in mind as we get more intentional about teaching children to read? I think one thing that's very important to remember um, is that all children, as we know, all children learn and develop and grow at different paces with everything from learning to walk and learning to crawl, riding your bike. It's the same with reading. I feel like there's a very strong focus lately on like, okay, we got to learn to read. We got to do this. We're going to college next year, starting in kindergarten. <laughs> right. So I think it's really important to just kind of, that takes the weight off a little bit too, of just remembering, okay, like they will develop at their own speed with reading as well. Um, so when we have those tools in place to learn all of these skills step by step, it will happen. Of course, you know, there are cases where extra intervention is needed and assessment and things like that. But I think taking the pressure off of my child must read X level by X grade um, 
I think there have been a lot of developments in reading instruction over the years. And I think at times there can be a lot of pressure of, okay, at the end of first grade, they need to be reading on a level, whatever. Um, so I think just kind of taking a step away from that pressure um, and just remembering that your child is going to develop their reading skills and when they get them, they will take off. So yeah, just to kind of lessen the pressure of, ah, oh, I have to get them reading right now. It has to happen right away. <laughs> it will happen. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Yeah, just be observing your child, seeing, um, you know, what are what are some things they're doing? Like, are they noticing sight words? Like, oh, you know, there's Wegmans, there's White, so there's like the grocery store. Like, they're they're realizing that letters mean something. Um, if they can follow, like two-step directions they say sometimes like that's showing that they can juggle more in their brain at once because reading it juggles you know at least three to five things at the same time so when they can do that um I've heard it said that when they can skip you know some people say it's that that's kind of a a clue that they're starting to be ready um but yeah like you were saying reading to your child immersing them in the word and print even from a young age they're in some ways going to show you when they're ready. Um, but as Sarah said, you know, lose the timeline, right? Um, <laughs> they're all going to learn a different rate. Some are going to be reading at three, some are going to be reading at nine. And the point is they're going to be reading. That's a really interesting thing. I know I've mentioned on the Colby cast before that in our family, everybody's a slow reader. I mean, so it's it, with our first, I said this before, our first daughter, though, it was kind of like tears all the time because you're trying to you're like, no, you need to be reading now. It's, it, I mean, my, my wife was much more gentle than that, actually. But but it was still a lot of, you know, we've got to keep doing this every day. And then, you know, by the time we're at my fifth now, it's it's like, OK, this is just the way that we we are. But I was even remembering that was kind of the way it was when you're talking about that sort of pressure. I remember I have a memory of being four years old and going, being told that I was going to preschool. So the first time, and it was like, my, but my cousin's not going to preschool. And it's like, well, she reads already. So she doesn't, she, they don't oh. like, oh, I guess I'm behind. But by third grade as well, I was, I was reading really well, but uh, it was a sl I enjoyed the process actually, but it, it took probably until third grade before I was a really solid reader. But um, so that's my personal thing. But to with some of our people like me, when's the when's the time to you know not stress and just know this is everybody moves at their own pace, but or when is the time to say, hmm, maybe there's something vision wise here that it's there's another what are the clues or are there clues that you know whether this is okay or whether you should look into things for young moms that's a great question i think first time moms want to jump quickly to oh something's wrong so the first thing i would do is make sure that you're choosing a good progression for the student you know like a quick google search of phonics pages for example Sometimes there are pictures on there they don't understand. There's, um, you know, letter sounds they haven't learned yet, and it's going to be at a frustrational level. So choosing something that's not at a frustrational level, going, you know, maybe just learning one to two things at a time, you know, for a week. And, and also, you know, assuming that you're choosing a good time of day, right? They're fed, they're not too sleepy, um, they've had fresh air. If all those things have been thought of, and it's still something that isn't just an emotional block, which, you know, happens as well, especially when fear is involved, then it might be time to, to look into like the vision tracking or occupational therapy, something like that. Um, you know, I, we had an experience where we did take ours, you know, to get it evaluated and she had something called ptosis, you know, which resolves usually by five or six. So it's still like a lot of things in their vision are still forming and growing till about, you know, age of reason and, you know, readiness for reading. So when it's more, you know, I think it'll just become apparent, like we're, we've kind of covered all the bases and it's still not working well, um, even a little bit, but often even things like that do sort themselves out. I think another thing to just kind of be aware of is when you are introducing um, different skills to them. So say like, for example, like introducing letter identification and letter sound. If with repeated and repeated can vary from 
child to child as in terms of like how much repetition is necessary um, to like learn those skills. But if with repeated exposure to, okay, this is the letter B, this is the sound it makes, um, they're not making the connection for like a, a number of letters and sounds, that would be another instance to kind of say, okay, let's take a step back and like see if there's something more possibly going on. Just because vision is so like integrated, I mean, that's how we read, you know, <laughs> um, it's a very important piece of it. So yeah, just to add that on. Well, you mentioned phonics. I, that was what I want to talk about next. Actually, I remember it as a fixture of my upbringing and I still sometimes refer to phonics concepts when working with my parish choir. And, and I'm like, there's a pun. you remember phonics class? And they look at me like, really? <laughs> but uh, it, it applies. It actually does. So, um, it's a part of Colby's language arts curriculum for the elementary grades, Kristen, how about you take it from here on the role and importance of phonics in reading instruction? Crucial. <laughs> it's very crucial. So often, you know, we start them on the alphabet song and that's a great place to start. They, they pick it up really quickly. Um, but we have to actually take a moment to connect the sound with the letter. Um, I'm so thankful my first grade teacher changed the alphabet song for us and it included the sounds, um, including their, you know, secondary sounds. And so I learned it, you know, much more quickly but I think something to remember is when it's in a song or when they've seen it, like even one after the other up on like um, a sign or maybe you have like a alphabet, you know, banner in your classroom or room, school room, um, they'll remember the order. Um, and even, you know, they might, you might be able to, to point to a letter and they'll say this, the letter. Um, but if you point to it out of order, they might not actually know the letter. So just taking a few minutes to even assess at the very beginning, do you actually know the name of this letter or are you remembering it from the song? Are you remembering it? They have such an amazing memory at that age. Um, and then connecting it with the sound, like always connecting with the sound that, that in some ways understanding, you know, a, a, you know, is far more important than even understanding that the sound goes with the letter. So even just the sounds first um, and then connecting with the letter and then doing that every day. And even if they, you think they know it, having just a little bit of review every single day and then they get into the pattern of that because um, they need the review. You know, they learned W a few weeks ago. They're going to need to learn W again, <laughs> um, especially those last four <laughs> of the alpha. I find that they just need to keep doing it. Um, so not being afraid to keep doing it because that is truly the foundation is the sounds. And like I said earlier, just making sure you, even as silly as, it, as this may seem, that you know the letter sounds, right? T, not T. <laughs> Sarah, what, what do you want to add there? <laughs> Yes. Um, yes, definitely about the adding the uh on the end. And that's something that I honestly didn't until I had like my like master's course reading instruction. That was when it was like, okay, here are these sounds. Like, remember, don't add the uh to it. It's just something very instinctual. When we say, oh, buh, of course it's buh, buh, buh. But it's harder to say it without that uh on the end of it. Um, but it really it's important because as we start blending those letters together, if you add the us in between everything, it gets choppier and tougher. So yes, definitely on that. I think another piece that helps with, with, with the phonics piece and learning all those sounds um, is incorporating something tactile in the learning experience, um, whether it's, this is something that I learned with an Orton Gillingham training that I did, incorporating having something tactile that they're working with. So for one example, what I would have my kindergartners do last year is we would have a little plate with like flour or sand. And as you're saying the sounds, they would trace it in the sand and trace it in the flour and just adding something physical to their learning. Just like Kristen said, with like singing, adding a song to the learning helps the brain to remember those pieces same thing same thing buddy with adding something tactile it stimulates the brain to make the connections more so whether that's building with legos like kids love legos sometimes we would build letters and sounds with legos flower sand hunting around the house for letters you know hiding different letter cards around the house and searching for them um, just adding in that like movement piece both just tactically to like build the sounds with their hands and also move their bodies there's been so much research that's been done um, that's shown how brain activity is stimulated when the body is moving um, and children and adults are able to like learn things with more movement of the body, your brain is just like activated and it's kind of supercharged and it keeps learning things more. Um, so that's just something that I always try to incorporate 
is adding in that movement and that different tactile experience. When you're talking about the sounds of the letters, it was reminding me of a story that my wife told since she grew up in a kind of a homeschooling situation. One of the younger siblings going into the doctor's office and they're doing the eye check. And it's like, what what letter is this? A ah, or what you know, giving the different sounds. It's like, you know, <laughs> like, okay, we're homeschooling. So this is this is different. Above yeah. and beyond on that one. Good deal. I think in terms of groundwork, I think similar to what Kristen was saying, just kind of making it fun. I mean, that's kind of the experience with um, teaching a lot of things at the younger ages is making it fun and enjoyable. So it's a game that they're playing, but in actual fact, they're learning from the experience. I think that's just a really important thing to remember, even with teaching reading and learning reading skills and things like that, um, using as many fun game type activities as possible helps to make it more enjoyable as they're actually learning how to read and put these letters together. And I think a really big thing with the young ones too, when learning reading is building that confidence um, because so easily when, I mean, adults, but student children too, when they get frustrated, it like hits this wall of, oh no, I can't do it. I'm not going to try. I'm just going to stop. Um, which then of course makes it harder for both the parent and the child as you're trying to continue building these reading skills and learning um, if there's that hesitation of, no, I can't do it, I did it wrong. So I think another important thing is just when that, because it's gonna happen with everyone, when that you know hesitation or I can't do this is encountered is just like giving yourself the grace to like give it a pause, shift to something else and come back later, just so that there isn't that like, I don't know, like rubbing of head, not rubbing of heads, but like upset with the experience. Um, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Just, I mean, flood it with prayer, truly. My, my first um, kiddo here, you're not every mom can get up and make it fun every day, especially if you've got a little one, like in addition to that one. Um, and I was just like, Lord, I need an idea. And he just, I just felt, you know, love notes, um, write her little notes. And I'd write her little notes that I could just have a post-it pad and um, I put them places and it, it made her really want to know what was on those pieces of paper. And so that's what did it for her because for her, I think she had that, um, I think similar to a lot of kids where it's the first really hard thing that they've had to do. And they're not used to that. Um, for other kids, you know, they're used to trying, it might take them forever to learn to tie their shoes, you know. This one was not that breed. <laughs> it's just like, this is hard. I don't think I can do it. So just, you know, flood it with prayer. The Lord knows your kids best. Um, and sometimes reading class that day is going to become a storybook. And that also is really good. You can say, like, raise your hand when you hear an R sound. It, you can go off the lesson, you know, for the day, and it can become perhaps the best lesson you could have done because it shows them. To calm down we can keep it fun and they're still going to keep learning because <laughs> they're calmer and they're going to receive it possibly even better and learn how to deal with adversity when that happens too so yeah that's a good skill as well <laughs> like this is hard but we can do it okay and I think another thing um, in addition to what Kristen was saying was using what you know that your child is interested in as kind of a lever um so like she said, the love notes to her little girl helped get her interested. Okay, I really want to learn how to read these. Um, maybe your little one is really interested in dinosaurs or Legos or ballerinas or princesses or something. Um, pulling in those pieces can always help that motivation um, to just be more interested um, in what you are learning and teaching. So Kristen, you mentioned that you worked on Colby's, is it kindergarten? phonics curriculum what what goes into that I'm curious about that what we tell me more about that sure um I was blessed to collaborate um with a couple of different people on it but um we kind of chose a progression similar to Orton Gillingham uh and just it begins a lot with the review of the sounds um and then we sought to incorporate a lot of uh Kind of different activities that they might normally want to do things like um sarah saying like forming letters in salt salt uh doing salt dough things like that making it fun the goal is to have it be kind of a a one-stop shop for mom like she can it doesn't require a huge amount of preparation especially if she has other kids and or even a newborn or she you know bring me the phonics book and it's you know kind of a whole 
um, a, a whole lesson just ready to go. So they do coloring, they're matching, they're um, connecting the dots. So lots of different um, activities for that progression that we chose. I mean, you know, learning how to identify vowels versus consonants, um, you know, building building words from, you know, CVC, CVCE, where we have consonant, vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, consonant, you know, helper E, um, starting with that and then just very slowly building their vocabulary. Um, that's kind of the trickiest part is understanding like how to form their word bank in their mind, you know, both that they'll be able to quickly remember, oh yes, like sight words, like the and and, but also to remember the rules to read them um, at, you know, at an easy level um, so that they can actually have a group of words to work with and, you know, slowly start to read. The, the whole goal is to build their confidence so that they maybe don't even realize that they're reading. And it's, it was a lot of joy to work on. Um, it's in production right now, and I'm seeing sneak peeks of the design. It's just very exciting. So when you mentioned Orton Gillingham, can you tell me more about what that is for those of us unfamiliar with it? It can be used really with um, any students that just need additional support with those literacy learning pieces. It has an order in which the letters and sounds are learned so that students like the first when they learn the first like five or ten sounds those sounds form a whole myriad of words so like Kristen said it builds their confidence oh I can read all of these words even just knowing a few letters and a few sounds you can start reading um, so it groups the letters in order so that there's a number of words that can be read with them and then it also uses a lot of tactile learning experiences just because adding that in with the repetition is helpful for all little learners, adding in movement and repetition is very key. Well, as with so many other things these days, there are apps designed to help children learn to read a whole bunch of them. I did a quick search and I was like, oh, whoa, this is more than a bargain for it. Um, what do you two think about the value of these apps and their place? I think they can be helpful when used in conjunction with other um, practice. I think, I think there's nothing that can replace like having an actual book in your hands and, you know, being able to point to the physical like words and pictures and letters and things like that. But I do think, I mean, we are in such a technological age. I think apps can definitely be very helpful in working on those skills and helping add that repetition in. Um, and even as like, okay, if we do, you know, as a little extra reward, we're going to, you know, work on this at home and then we can do half an hour or 15 minutes or depending on the age of the child um, playing the games on the app because often they are built in as like game game style learning which is perfect for this age and I mean a lot of them have those little avatars and they get to pick their character and add on like hats and pom-poms <laughs> exciting things as they like <laughs> rank up or whatever um, so I think they definitely have their place yeah, I agree. Definitely application versus instruction. You let them go practice what they learned, but still it's good to vet them, right? Content, but also are they, is the program actually going to give them the level that um, they need? Um, like I said, quick Google search of phonics worksheets will maybe make you laugh. Like you're teaching them things like um, just like something simple. If they're learning long E, putting like a sheep on the page when they haven't learned SH yet, like things like that, or they're actually not um, it might just be frustrational and then they get a score and they might have gotten it right or they might have just chosen that one. You don't actually really know if they've mastered it. Um, so we keep it pretty low tech <laughs> here, but I will say one thing we did add on um, with this with this student's reading was um, they, they have these little LCD tablets now. Um, they're amazing. Uh, they're sort of like a combination between like a light bright and a, um, a magna doodle. Um, very low tech. It's not really connected to the internet or anything, but it's super helpful because you're not just writing with pencil and paper and it's easy to take on the go. Um, so that's definitely something I highly encourage um, for the apps. Yeah, I would just vet them really well and have it be more of like a reward maybe for doing a good job in, in the lesson. So it's not the primary, okay, you do your lesson on this and check. I'll check on you later kind of, okay. Just any, I mean, so I would assume this was the case. I'm trying to remember if it's my experience, but the influence of older siblings or on parents reading, does that, I assume that would help if if there's a, an excitement or, or whatever, but if you noticed any 
any benefits to that? Yeah, I have um, my middle thinks that reading is hard because <laughs> it's something her big sister just does. And so um, she can read, but she insists that she can't. <laughs> she can't do it yet. It's a big girl thing. Um, whereas my toddler knows that his sister reads to him. And so he sees it as like, um, not so much like a, a far away thing, but oh yeah, I can do this. I'm reading with her. Um, so yeah, I think it depends on the kids and maybe birth order a little bit. But um, now that my middle is realizing a little bit that she can read, they're starting to talk about it. Like, oh, did you see that sign? So it's, you know, she doesn't even like realize we're hearing her do this, but I think um, it's neat when you join the ranks of your older siblings and anything like bike riding or yes, reading. It's, there's just a joy. There's a, there's a greater ability for unity in the family. Yeah, I, I definitely not that I, I don't I don't have multiple littles yet, but even just seeing um, the experience in the classroom teaching, um, it, it definitely can impact um, even just having that extra person in the home who can read with the child, like, you know, big brother, big sister is reading you stories during the day or helping you with your reading homework or practice activities, or even because often in kindergarten, I would send home like games for them to do. Um, one style that I used a lot was sorting. It's from a word study program where it practices blending and building words using the different like orthographic features and the ways that words are put together. And so I would send home these sorting games that big brother or big sister would play with them too. Um, so I think definitely having other siblings in the house that are reading or readers or helping them read definitely can play a big role. I'm thinking back to uh, my daughter who's now 14. She is my third child and we would bring home several bags of books from the library. Fresh book day was always a big day here and she would just go through them all. I can just hear her reading them a lot, reading <laughs> in air quotes, reading them to herself as she was thumbing through all the pages and, and then the brothers would come and dig through the bag to find what, what they could read, but she was eager to read what they were doing. So, yeah. Yeah. And even that reading when they're not, you know, actually reading the story is, you know, it's that introduction to it, that it, it built, it brings in their imagination and, you know, just starting to build that confidence of, Hey, I read that. Even if it's not the words at all on the page, they're making up their own story <laughs> in their mind. They are reading. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. Yes then they have that kind of positive association with it. Like mm -hmm. I can do this. Like, and that, like that confidence, like you're talking about. Like, exactly. It's only been a couple of years that my youngest child hasn't had a phonics book to work through as part of her Colby language arts curriculum. I was a bit surprised initially that the phonics curriculum went up into sixth grade as it does. Do you have any thoughts about that, about the continuing to study that past the point where, okay, I can read this now. Why, why do I need, what else is there? What's left to study in phonics from there? I think um, when you get to those higher grades, um, learning the different word features, like m more complex words, we know that, you know, a lot of the words in the English language come from Greek and Latin roots and all these different things. I think when it gets to that stage, um, the phonics piece is learning more about like where the words come from. And, you know, once you learn one word, you know, this root also can teach you about this word and about this word and you add a different ending and it gives you this new word. So it's kind of a more complex take on, okay, the beginning of phonics is here, these letters come together to make a word. Um, but at that stage, it's more, okay, here's my root word. And I add these letters make this ending, these make that ending. So I think it just kind of morphs as, as the levels move up in terms of what exactly you're working on in that phonics curriculum. But again, it's still all those building blocks that put all that word formation together. Definitely. I think they also see that it connects to their other subjects like vocabulary. And if mm -hmm. they're starting Latin or a different language, mm -hmm. um, and then just also understanding like they have the help if they need it, um, which sometimes they realize they do. <laughs> um, and also helps with humility, like, yep, we do still work on this, <laughs> you know. Um, I definitely see there, there's a good benefit for that. I guess I probably should have volunteered to teach my small children, although I would have been horrible at it. But we have, I regularly have conversations where I'll suddenly go back to my rural Wisconsin pronunciation of words. And then we'll start talking about, like, is it sorry or sorry? 
Um, and then, <laughs> then we'll start talking about, but it's worry, isn't it? So shouldn't it be sorry, like worry? And so I should have learned all of these things. My, my wife just kind of says, no, stop, please. <laughs> Please just don't corrupt the children's language. This is a frequent conversation <laughs> in our house as well. <laughs> my mom was from Pittsburgh, but my father is from Maryland. It's an interesting bet. The uh, Our kids have a current kind of running battle of who's going to say syrup like mom or syrup like dad. So <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do you all have any particular resources or recommendations you want to give to our listeners? In terms of the apps, um, two that I have used in the past that I think were well for the young ones are ABC Mouse um, and Starfall. Um, again, like Kristen and I had mentioned, in conjunction with other instruction I think those are good ones. Um, and then for the early readers, the Bob books are a good set to start with just because it does focus on like, instead of throwing in these big fancy sentences, it focuses on simple sentences with words that they can decode knowing just, you know, a couple sounds at a time, like I can such and such. Um, but I think those are two, those are some good resources that are that parents can pull to use at home. Um, I think another important thing that can be helpful, and I can I can send you a couple links if you'd like, um, YouTube links of videos um, with letter sounds, because I think that's such a intimidating thing for parents at times, being like, oh, well, uh, what's the sound that that one makes? And even as you were mentioning, Stephen, like there are so many different ways of pronouncing sounds and words and things. Um, and there are so many letters that make different sounds. You know, there are some that just have the one sound, but then there are others where it makes a variety of different sounds. So I think having a tool to help with just teaching the letter sounds can be helpful and kind of take the intimidation factor away for parents too. Yeah. Definitely. I think too, we have a tendency when we're Googling like, oh, reading in kindergarten and just so much comes up. Um, it's sort of like going to the grocery store without a grocery list and you have way too much that you've put on your Pinterest board. Um, so like looking ahead <laughs> to, to what are they about to learn, right? So yeah, terminology like CVC, right? Consonant, vowel, consonant. And then you can Google like CVC worksheet, reverse grade. And then it's more specialized to what you're going to be doing in those weeks, just to help with your own planning as, as mom or, you know, or dad. Um, there are a ton of wonderful resources on YouTube. Um, shout out to Learning at the Primary Pond. She's amazing. Um, she has something new every week for sure. And there's a lot of you know, teachers who took to YouTube, especially during the pandemic and stayed there because they were so helpful. So forming you first and then um, preparing to teach is I think really helpful. Yeah, don't don't go it alone. <laughs> Definitely form yourself first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think like Kristen said, becoming familiar with um, some of the terminology used with teaching reading. Um, I think another piece that's very important, especially at the early stage is blending or sounding words out. There have been over the years different ways to teach reading, um, but consistently, consistently research has shown that like blending and sounding out words helps to, they learned how to phonetically pronounce the word, then read the word. Um, so I think just becoming familiar and comfortable with practicing blending and practicing sounding words out, which sounds intimidating, but really it's just, you take the word, you break it up sound by sound, make that like, for example, the word bat, b at and then you blend or you put the sounds all together um i think just becoming confident as the parent you know as much as you can <laughs> with a constant with a skill set that you're like oh i'm not totally versed in this but like learning um how that practice works can be helpful yeah too. like learning the practice and then even adding in something to facilitate that so like the you know but at um if the if you're pointing to it doesn't work, use a car, right? Use a bear mm -hmm. counter. Use something. It's the same process, um, but use something to get their attention and work with it. Um, so when you know that terminology, then you can really broaden as you're learning yourself um, how to facilitate that skill. Um, that's been that was super helpful for me for sure. Okay. 
as with so much of Colby's curriculum, the tried and true is very much present along with the best of, of the new, of what's right now, the newest research, you know, you're speaking to the research that has gone on. And another thing I appreciate about Colby, this is a, the, the, I haven't had to piece things together or reinvent the wheel or anything mm-hmm. like that. These are all integrated aspects. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really important too, to remember is that, you know, doing that research to discover, okay, like this is, this is the, this is the most helpful way to teach these things. And just knowing that it's not just a, okay, here, here it is one and done. That's it. Like, you know, having different tools in your tool belt for the child who learns better with music or for the child who really wants to play with Play-Doh. Okay. Let's, let's build our letters with Play-Doh. Um, but yes, always going back to that research of, okay, like what, what is showing the, that students are learning most consistently how to read and really getting down to that blending, sounding out phonics has been consistently, consistently the way to go. Yeah. Well, I remember at the beginning of our homeschooling experience, when, when we are choosing which pieces of curriculum to incorporate, because there is this whole, you know, such an array, the question, do we need to do phonics? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is like a, yes, we do. <laughs> We're doing that one. We're keeping that one in. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure glad we did. And I definitely see it. Uh, translating into other uh, subjects, vocabulary, especially in, in the languages that they're starting to pick up and things mm-hmm. like that. So yeah, definitely the value has shown itself. Just to piggyback off of that, it it does translate into other subjects as well. Cause you know, as kids learn how to read, then they learn, they read to learn. So they use those reading skills to learn about other content areas. So it's, it really is the basis for a whole variety of different subject areas. Hence why it's an important topic to talk about. <laughs> Definitely. Sarah, are your services as an um, intervention lab and your reading specialist, are those for uh, the online elementary students or are those for all the Colby families? Um, currently, just the online elementary students. Okay. Yes, but we will see what it expands to. Gotcha. So this is, this is the first year that I've been functioning as the reading specialist. Um, it's just been the K to two online so far, but I know that we're having conversations of, you know, where the need is really um, is where we want to provide that extra support. Okay. I'm thinking we're going to keep Sarah and Kristen busy here. In the upcoming <laughs> That's right. Speaking of busy, we're moving, my husband's Navy, um, and we are moving to Japan in April. Oh. So the time zone swap will be a little interesting, um, but it sounds like there will be lots of um, asynchronous projects that I can work on, you know, making videos of certain things and stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> but that's, yeah, just a beautiful thing about Colby is that it can literally travel around the world with us. Mm-hmm. And there are ways that I can, you know, keep up with teaching and serving and it's a great school. We haven't talked to anybody in Japan yet. We have been kind of all, uh-huh. over, all over the place now. Well, I'll let Japan you know yet. when I get there. <laughs> Well, Sarah and Kristen, this has been a great conversation, hugely helpful to our listeners. I know a lot of grateful folks hearing all of your insights and experience and suggestions. Thank you so much for all you've offered to us and for coming to visit with us today. Of course. Thanks for having us. Yes. Thank you for having us, Bonnie. Subscribe to the Colby cast on your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss an episode and let us know how we're doing by leaving a rating or review. And as always, feel free to email us at podcast at colby.org. Mary, our mother, pray for us. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Ad maiorem Dei Gloriam.